Um, I'm Julie Davidson. I'm with the Tourist Office for Flanders, Belgium, and we're located in New York. And um, some of you might be wondering if I'm Belgian. And in fact, quite often people tell me how they're surprised to speak English. And I always say, thank you so much. I am from Brooklyn, New York. So in answer to that question, I am not Belgian, but I am in a our office here in New York, we, we cover New York, so we're, uh, Canada and the United States. And there are five of us in the office, and four Belgians and me, and I'm the expert. Because when I go over to them, I go, you know, I bring groups over, and I go myself, and I stay in hotels, and I go to restaurants, and I visit the attractions. So I know Belgium in a different way than my colleagues do, because when they go back, they're going home. So when they need a hotel or a restaurant recommendation, they ask me. So there you go. Anyway, so today I'm happy to talk to you about a few subjects. Uh, the first one that we're going to start with is going to be about World War I. But I think before we get into that, let's just kind of set the stage so everybody knows what, what and where we're talking about. So where is it located? So as you see that the dot right in the center there is Brussels, which is the capital of Belgium. And it's really very, very centrally located, right in the heart of Western Europe. It's in the middle of everything. It's you know right in the middle of London, Amsterdam, and Paris. And Cologne is, and I know everybody has clients in Amsterdam and Paris. So um, people don't always think about because we're kind of like on the way, you know, if you were going from Amsterdam to Paris, but it's really, really well worth a, a stop, and I'll tell you more about why they should stop later on as we go on. So um, where is Flanders? What is Flanders? It's, it, tourism in Belgium used to be on a national level, so there was the Belgian tourist office, which represented the whole country, but about two years ago, reflecting sort of the political situation over there, they decided to divide the offices. So we, they established the Tourist Office for Flanders, which is who I work for. Flanders is the northern part of Belgium, where they speak Flemish, which is the Dutch language. And that's where cities like Bruges and Ghent and Antwerp and Brussels are all located within Flanders. The southern part of Belgium is called Wallonia. And that's the French-speaking part. So that's kind of how things get divided. So I thought I would start out today with actually telling you about some of the new things that are happening in our part of the world. The first one that's going to be this September is the opening of the Red Star Line Museum in Antwerp. And what is that all about? The Red Star Line was a shipping company that between the 1870s and the 1930s, they sailed from uh, Antwerp to New York and Philadelphia. And during that time period, over 2 million immigrants left Central and Eastern Europe to make their way to North America to have better lives. And uh, several years ago in Antwerp, they realized that they had these buildings that were completely disused and ignored. And they finally figured out that these buildings are an amazing. And they're under renovation right now. Um, they're being renovated by the same architects that did Ellis Island in New York. And the museum will be opening in September. And it's a museum about immigration and people's lives and hopes and dreams and as they like to say in Antwerp, there's two million, over 2 million people and over 2 million stories. So that's something that's coming up that we're quite excited about. So these are just some, that's like a nice vintage postcard from the Red Star Line. This is an, uh, an old picture of the And I apologize, I don't quite know why this is happening, but the names underneath are from the, the next slide, so that's, thank you, <laughs> <laughs> that's Irving Berlin, because he came with his family. Albert Einstein was a passenger. 
another nice uh, vintage postcard. Some of the passengers that were in steerage, they, they were all different classes of service. Obviously, most of the immigrants came in, in steerage. So here's the next subject that I very much want to talk about. Um, some of you may have been on a previous webinar with me, and I was also in Canada for three weeks last fall doing a road show. So maybe some of you saw my presentation then. But in any event, I want to talk to you again, because this is really big for us. It's coming up to the 100th anniversary of World War I, and that will be 2014 to 2018. Um, it's you know right on the coast, on the way to England. So the, it's always the site. It's always been the site of uh, battles and wars, unfortunately for them. But it is coming up for the hundredth anniversary. So um, for the for Americans, the we got into the war later on. We got into the war like 2017. 2000, listen to me, 1917. So by the time the United States got into the war, most of the fighting that the Americans saw was in France. But the Canadians and the British and the Australians and the New Zealanders, New Zealanders were all in the war from the very beginning. So um, Canadians saw a lot of action in Flanders from 1914. or somebody that knew somebody that fought in the war. So I know it's, it really resonates. So what, what are we going to be doing? We're preparing for the centenary, and the theme that they are calling it is Flanders Remembers. So this is a picture of the city of Ypres, which is the center of touring in the Flanders field. I'd like to show you what it looks like now, because when you see that picture, it's like, oh my goodness. So that's the building now. It's been, it was rebuilt. And it's just a little parenthetically, it's sort of an interesting story. After World War I, they had a big decision to make, because this is a really magnificent building. It's called the Cloth Hall, which is now home to the Inn Flanders Fields Museum. And the decision that they had to make was, do we build a modern city, or do we rebuild it to look like the medieval city that was destroyed? And the decision was made to rebuild it to look like the medieval city that had been destroyed. So when you look at these wonderful buildings, they look like you know medieval buildings in other parts of Flanders, like in Ghent or Bruges, but the, the, these buildings are actually from the 1920s. So, but Ypres has very much risen from the ashes. So what are our objectives? The first one is to keep the room of World War I on a war. It's really a mess. So want to keep that in mind. And the Flemish government is embarking on five strategic projects in regard to the centenary. The first one, which I just mentioned, but that's, it's housed in the cloth hall that I just showed you the picture of, is the In Flanders Fields Museum. And it's been, it had been closed for about six months because they were expanding it very much. It reopened last June. So it's 50% larger. There's new infrastructure. It's very interactive. When you come into the museum, you get a bracelet. And you kind of, as you go through the museum, you touch your bracelet onto some sort of reader, and it tells you you're, you're actually following the And one of the new things that occurred when they reopened the building is you can go up to the very top of the belfry, which used had not been open you know, to the public before that. And you can look out over the whole area, which is really nice. This is in Passchendaele. And there's a wonderful museum there. And they have part of it is this also 
a hands-on trench experience where you can actually walk in down in the trench think what the kind of conditions that they had to go through in bitter winter cold so that's really well worth a visit this is a place hope but Inga, which is referred to as behind the front. The British soldiers referred to it as Pops when it was a place was was literally was just behind the front, so that when when the soldiers needed to have some R and R, some rest and rest, they would go to Poperinga. And one of the very well known places in Poperinga is. and you can have like a cup of tea and it's, they actually have um, some rooms. It's a, it functions as a bed and breakfast like, so clients can stay there. And it's really like stepping back in time. It's really wonderful. So that's one of the things to do in Poperinga. There's some other things as well. This is the Isa Tower in Dijksmuda. It was a monument that was built after the war to you know, remember for remembrance, and they're going to be renewing, uh, they're renewing the museum there in Dijksmuda. And finally, this is uh, along the coast in Newport, which is on the North Sea. What was happening during the war that uh, the Germans were trying to advance, this, and in order to stop the advancing of the German army, they literally flooded the area deliberately so that they couldn't make their way to the coast. So there's a visitor center there. It's interesting. You can see what Gansaput in Dutch uh, means duck foot or goose foot. I'm not sure. And if you look at it, you can see that it actually looks like the foot of a, a goose or a duck. So that's what that name comes from. So there's there This is the Mate in Eper, which was built after the war to honor the soldiers who, who they didn't remains. They knew that they died during the war, but they, their remains were never found. And every night since then, with the exception of during World War II, they have done a ceremony called the Last Post, where they play this, you know, bugles and this little ceremony that's done just in remembrance and to honor the fallen. And the 30,000th last post will take place July 9th of 2015. So that's coming up. And that's an EPA, by the way. Uh, one of the questions which we don't know the answer to, but we're kind of keeping our fingers crossed, whenever they talk about World War I, they always say that the landscape was one of the participants because if you look out over the area, especially if you did it from the Ether Tower or from the Belfry in Eper, you, you can see how flat the region was. And they were just fighting. They were going back and forth over such small, just tiny areas. That they, and this went on for years. So the, the, um, the landscape was definitely one of the participants. And we're hoping that UNESCO may declare the area a World Heritage Site. We don't know yet, but we'll stay tuned for that. But um, to this day, when the farmers in that area, it's a big farming region, when the farmers are tilling their fields all the time, they find live bombs, and they have to call in the bomb squads to have them removed. So it's just amazing, because it's 100 years later, but it's still real. It's still happening. So. So that's it for World War I. Now, because we don't only want to talk about World War I, there's a lot m more to see and do in Flanders as well. So I thought I would now switch gears a little bit and talk to you about some of the other things to do in Flanders. Because if you have clients that are going to be coming over, of course they're going to want to see the World War I sites. But they're going to want to do more than that as well. So this is Bruges, which is the entire center of Bruges. As you know,
wonderful. Now we're there. So they just did it this fifty thousand pattern. So absolutely. Dark, and this is in, this is along the river. Center, but it's not as well known, and it's very lively and very vibrant, and it's one of my. And this a couple of years ago, there's a lot going on, on the stream. them um, about the building is the building there are escalators Rama over Antwerp. It's really in Antwerp. Another favorite. I Known, but also really wonderful. Show this picture. It's one of my very if it were in Italy, it would probably be a church. Making cloth and tapestry. Mechelen and the Cern Dauphin, which is unfortunately during World War. Been renovated, and they've opened a museum of deportation and yeah, and also just to look around the town. It's just destination the best. Gastron.
of the four themes. Done, but I didn't. Team thousand restaurants. Read the last one. Unique culinary identity. Kind of interesting. World. Those. And what it is is party B. It's really wonderful. It's called Water Zoe. And it's Are what caused a little the right is those are shrimp popular in soon maybe. You can see on the right, and just lots of They have a must. You come into the shop. Full. Looks so delicious. They want Blanche, which is right across the street, Hotel Amigo. Shares. He's a child and he has shocking. Because he does unusual things. One of the Rolling Stones, but one of the Rolling Stones. I think it was Keith Richards. On this 
press the lever and up your nose. So that's Dominique Persona, but it's not mandatory. You don't have to do some of his creations. He has unusual. Doing some really, and this is one of his other things. That's another thing that every time I ask how many different beers there are, the number gets higher and higher. So there are some. This is one of my favorites. This is called a lambic. They're fruity beers. They come. In the crowd, this is beer that everybody likes. And there's some very, very, very famous trap. This is one of my very favorite things to do. This is in Gap.
allowed to visit inside the university and the castle? Uh, wow. So I'm not sure about that. I mean, I'm sure you could certainly walk around. Side. And interestingly enough, it is a museum now of medieval um, We also have another question from Jennifer. She's asking, um, you mentioned Definitely seasonal. I think it lasts for maybe about six weeks, a month to six weeks. And in season. So it's around April, April, May time, you know, in the spring. Okay, great. So. or food culinary tourism in different cities? So you did partly answer that, I believe. She's question. asking if there's foodie tours in different cities of Flanders. We move on to the next question from Jennifer. For contraction in Dutch for the. E L K O T. So I'm just typing it in here for our. We have a question from and carpet in Brussels happened only two years and it was beautiful. and design it and then execute it. So it's just, I think, just ambition because it just looks so phenomenal. It's the same. It's amazing. So, so beautiful. It's it's called Laurent Gerbeau. Can I? And then his last name is Gerbeau, which is G E R. This, you know, obviously Flemish speaking. The South is French speaking. French, I mean, in the French part in Wallonia. The preponderance of people are French speaking. So somebody like Laurent.
kind of very French, and then when you go into the rest of Flanders, it's not French. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Je beau. Je beau. Um, our, uh, our guest here. Philip is asking, um, is the Jabra family... <laughs> Never Sorry. been to Budapest. Sorry, Philip, <laughs> but thanks so much for the question. Um, we will be sending out the recorded webinar to everyone who's registered. And Thanks. Bye now. You will now be disconnected.